All right, let's rock and roll. My name is Lawrence Rosenberg, and this is the Alpha Human Podcast. Our guest today is Michael Cursina. Michael is the founder of Spotter Up, a tactical gear website that doubles as an immense resource of information, reviews, articles, and podcasts featuring former or active duty members of the special operations community, master level shooters, special agents, case officers, athletes, and outdoor enthusiasts who share their knowledge on everything from guns and ammo to prepping and survival, martial arts, fitness, nutrition, and health. Michael is also the author of We Fight Monsters, wisdom and inspiration that speak to the warrior's soul. Michael, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me on. Oh, it's my pleasure. It's my pleasure. You know, um, I got to tell you, I read We Fight Monsters, and I just had to learn more about you, the man behind the book and the passages, uh, the, the, the paragraphs, the quotes, the essays that make up this compendium of wisdom, if you will. And I, I got to tell you, this is, you know, this was a tough one for me because I like to prepare for my podcast, do a lot of research. And I got to tell you, I mean, I could just randomly take three or four pages from your book and do a whole podcast on that with you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so, I mean, we could get into to a lot of subjects sure. based on your your thoughts on so many issues that you bring up. So we'll talk about them all. But first, before we get into We Fight Monsters, I'd love to set the stage for mm -hmm. this episode of the podcast uh, by quoting you from the book. So, I re-enlisted in the military after a 20-year separation and a brief lackluster career. At age 39, I was going nowhere. I was broke and for a long minute, jobless. I spent my free time drinking, fighting in bars and street corners and chasing women. I was good at being a loser. It was a matter of time before I permanently end up in jail. My self-destruction was born out of my frustration that I believed I was something and not that I was nothing. And I dreamt of opportunities to prove myself. The military saved me. I was losing my mind. Hope isn't just for young men and women. I applied myself and was good at nearly everything I did because I wasn't going to waste my second chance. God blessed me, but not in the way I thought. How good yet odd life is. Don't quit on yourself. So with that, Michael, tell us your journey and, and how you got to that place mm -hmm. in your life where you were on that path of self-destruction and perhaps even ending up in prison. How did you give yourself that second chance at life? Well, it's a very uh, good question. It's a lot to unpack. And I think uh, we're going to have a lot of material to talk about, and I hope I, um, you know, do you well. But um, basically, I graduated from high school, and uh, I was a bit of an ambitious kid, you know. Mm -hmm. um, I tell my stepson all the time, I said, uh, you talk about the parent that's, uh, you know, walking to school in the snow. Well, that was me. I was the guy at the top of the hill, and I ran to school, and then I ran to work. So that's a true story. You know, I ran, at, I ran from... Um, to the house, to McDonald's, you know, got up at 10 o'clock, ran home, you know, did my homework. I had to go to college because I missed classes. So mm -hmm. I was doing that in the senior year. And so I was a guy that, you know, I thought I'd apply myself. I ended up in the Marine Corps. The problem with the Marine Corps was that I had only spent six months there and three months in um, a, a separation station, which was uh, for an injury that I had. Okay. And it's kind of like uh, you take a person to the top of the mountain and you say, you can have everything here. And then all of a sudden, it's taken away from you. And that stayed with me pretty much my entire life. And so a decision I had made to separate from the Marine Corps due to an injury based off of some advice that was given mm -hmm. uh, furthered my decline. And I remember, you know, every year going to the recruiter and they would say, we don't want you. And <clears throat> so 25, here I am. I, I, I woke up one day at 25 and said, I am wasting my life away. 
I knew I had some great potential, but I didn't know how to apply it. Everywhere I went, they didn't want me. And so um, I ended up getting a second chance and I took a lot of chances, but I, I did a lot of things too that were very dangerous and very risky mm -hmm. uh, that could have put me in jail or prison. And um, I was out there searching. I was living an existential nightmare, a problem, which was trying to ascertain what is my purpose in life? What's true for me? What, where do I go? And I didn't have those answers. And so I began my escapades and uh, working and doing jobs that I really hated and uh, taking a big risk, which then in turn brought me back to where I am now. And um, on the sofa of a trusted advisor who is a uh, behavioral scientist, a uh, friend of mine, good friend of mine, and um, creating Spotter Up through that. So, okay, so you you joined the Marine Corps early on, and then you you decided to take some advice based because of an injury and leave the Marine Corps, Correct. and so so you regretted that decision. Absolutely, absolutely. I had a football injury that plagued me through boot camp. You know, I mean, I I I went through even though my leg was swollen twice the size. It was like an elephant's you know knee, and I, I made it through through just sheer grit. But I said, now what? You know, I'm in pain all the time. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, you're in a way station where people don't want to be there. And um, I said, you know, I can either stay and I don't know what my career is going to be. Or I can get out and take a chance. And I got out and took a chance. And it, to me, was the worst decision I ever made. But, you know, when I go back to the quote you stated uh, that I was blessed, but not in the way I thought, I can look back now and say, my God, that event and many events like that, very similar to that brought me to where I am now. And it brought me to the place where I could write a book and write about my experiences and share those thoughts with people. And so you, so 20 years later, mm -hmm. you, you do end up being able to, to, <laughs> right. I mean, that's a, you said you kept going to recruiters office and they kept, you know, right. turning you away. Right. So per persistence personified 20 right. years later, you, you finally go back in. I mean, at that point um, you, you were the oldest guy in the, uh, you know, yeah. Sure. In, in Iraq, they called me old man in Arabic and uh, my, my company called me old man. So I loved it. You know, it was a good, good name. But absolutely. Absolutely. I've been doing that ever since, um, you know, going uh, head to head with younger guys half my age and showing that, um, you know, it's like Mick Jagger. I mean, you know, you want to dance and sing on stage, you're 5000 years old. Go for it, man. I'm not going to put you down. I love the fact that people are out there uh, pushing themselves to the limit and they should. They should. What are they going to do? Sit at home, watch TV and die. I didn't think that was for me. And I just didn't know how to apply myself. I was looking for an avenue to apply myself and the doors kept shutting on me. But yeah, absolutely. I was, I was the uh, oldest guy everywhere I went. So I'll give you another quote from the book here. Sure. You say that when I was a boy growing up, my brother beat everyone in the neighborhood, mm -hmm. even through high school. We were not allowed to back down. If my mother found out that we'd been in a fight and jumped by kids, she would drive us around the neighborhood and we'd have to find the kid or the kids and refight everybody. Now, that's unheard of today and maybe crazy, but my mother was simply telling us no one is going to push my kids around. Can you tell us about how you grew up and, mm -hmm. and what shaped your beliefs and your ideals, uh, your, your code? so to speak, as a kid? Well, I'd say I grew up very dysfunctionally. I mean, uh, my parents met in Vietnam. Uh, I was born there in Saigon. Uh, my brother is uh, three, four years older than me. My sister, two years. My brother, I think a year or two younger than me. But um, so I uh, grew up there, came over here in 72. So we didn't come up with the, uh, come with the diaspora that came after with the fall of Saigon in 75, but we did have a lot of relatives. And, um, you know, it was very challenging because I didn't know what a boat person is. And I've heard all this, this, the, the, uh, the derogatory slurs. They don't affect me and I don't care. But at the time, as a young man uh, speaking English and Thai and Vietnamese, trying to integrate into America, American culture, I did not understand why we were fighting all the time. You know, people would throw rocks at us. They'd spit at us. Uh, they'd uh, slash our, our tires, you know, throw rocks through the windows and break our windows. Uh, so um, we didn't understand it, didn't have a clue. I didn't know anyone else who was Vietnamese other than one kid. 
if uh, we visited relatives, uh, we'd have to drive to LA from San Francisco. So, you know, 700 miles to meet someone who may have been from the same village or may have been from 10 villages re removed, you know, for out, out past the epicenter um, and call them auntie and uncle. That, that was it. We didn't know anyone. But my mother was a very tough person. She died uh, in October last year, and she was a tough person. I, I was talking to my dad the other day, and he said, you know, it was funny. I remember putting my finger in a, a, piece, of, a piece of frosting of cake, and my mother grabbed a rolling pin and chased me out the door in her nightgown in the daytime in front of everybody. And my dad laughed and said, yeah, that was your mother. She had a temper. So my mother was a, a very, very angry person, but she had some great qualities. And now that I'm older, I understand it. I mean, I remember being a child and my father, uh, my mother was yelling at him and then stabbed him in the belly with a knife. And I was just terrified. My dad says, go into the bath, take a bath. Another time she took a um, statue of Nefertiti that my dad had built and she smashed it over his head. So this is a woman who had a lot of anger, but I realized later on that she had PTSD. She had lost her family. She had lost her children because we didn't want to be Vietnamese. We wanted to be American. We wanted to eat hamburgers and French fries. Okay. Uh, she lost essentially her language and she was losing a marriage. And so she was losing everything. And so this is her reaction. She had survivor's guilt, didn't know how to integrate. I knew that my family, uh, some members were liquidated. Um, you know, my, my grandmother was liquid, liquidated. So we grew up um, in, a, in a neighborhood, which is just like any other kid. We played and had fun. We did games and did all the nerdy stuff that kids do when they grow up and have dreams and uh, ambitions. But at the same time, uh, my mother was a person who coming to this country said, no one is going to push me into a corner. I am a human being. And so we learned that. And it was very tough on us because my mother said, I, I am somebody. I'm somebody. You're not going to disrespect me. And my mother came from a culture, which is on, uh, you know, a, a, a pride and shame culture, right? So you didn't borrow money, for example, you know, mm. you have to be self-reliant. Um, you had to dress nicely, those kinds of things. So my father and mother were very different. My father was a very brilliant engineer. I mean, he did so much work. And at the age of 26, I think he was in charge of 22 sites in Vietnam doing secret work, the CIA and for, uh, as a contractor, uh, putting in listening stations and he'd get in a Huey and he'd fly out with the Marines up to the top of mountains and they'd build satellite dishes and they'd terraform the land. So he was a brilliant guy. My mother was a peasant from a small village, probably with as a joke, she said, we're rich. And uh, I said, what does that mean? My dad says, well, their family has two cows, you know, <laughs> everyone has one. So that's right. the joke. But um, so they were very different. My mother was a person who uh, was of a Buddhist faith, you know, I believe genies lived under the village and gave power to the village and uh, was life sustaining. My father was a Catholic at the time. And so it was very different. There's a dichotomy growing up. Um, so mm -hmm. we read books, lots and lots and lots of books. Um, and, uh, we also played like other kids, but again, uh, with my mother, it was an odd life. Uh, I didn't understand. I, I could not comprehend how someone so beautiful could be so tough and so mean. And, um, you know, to cap off the story, uh, years ago before she passed away, the hospital called me and they said, your mother's here with a broken shoulder. And I said to the doctor, let me guess. And I said one word, I said, let me guess fighting. And he said, yes. He said, she got in a fight with three guys on the bus. I said, yeah, I'll come and pick her up. So yeah. some people may think that's a fantastic story. And I think we're dealing with her death now and just trying to process all of that. But that whole life with my mother being such a tough individual uh, and so violent and yet had a soft side was very trying for me. But I, I, I'm fortunate to have had that life because it's made me who I am with that uh, grit and mm. so that was kind of my background yeah that's that's a, a real interesting upbringing and uh you know i could see potentially i mean i don't want to assume the segue into your desire to to join the marines and and to uh join the military but can you tell us um mm -hmm. what so what ended up being your inspiration uh for wanting to go into the marines and then ultimately going going back and, and joining the army later on. <laughs> well, I'll tell you, I remember a funny story. I remember my brother was fighting a guy in the street, this uh, high school kid, uh, older guy, and they're seniors, you know? Um, and we were just little kids. We were hiding behind the fence and we were just rooting like, oh my God, my brother's, you know, just dangerous. He walked out there by himself. He was surrounded by the neighborhood kids. And then he saw us 
after he beat the hell out of the guy and he saw us and turned around and says, Hey, get the F out of there. You know, I'll get you too. You know, like this guy was just tough. My brother was just tough as rocks. And uh, he ended up going to the Marine Corps and everyone that was in high school in that group of kids that followed him, actually, they all went into the Marine Corps too. So six okay. of us went to the Marine Corps. We followed thereafter. My desire to go in the Marine Corps actually uh, was by two parts. Uh, one part was I was surrounded one day by a gang of guys, it was probably 18. And I just remembered they surrounded me, tried to scare me and then spit in my face. And I remember how mortified it was. I stood there and did nothing. I didn't know what to do. And, and I thought, what a weak person. I walked away from that experience saying, what a weak, weak person. Even though we fought kids and stuff, I'd never been confronted by, a, you know, someone my age as an adult, maybe as a kid, sure. And the second one, I got into a fight with a guy pretty bad. I heard him really, really bad. And I thought I killed the guy. I ended up seeing him years later, uh, which, you know, was shocking. And I said, well, I've got to get out of here. So I called the recruiters to get me out of here. And in two days, I was gone. Wow. So I ended up uh, in the Marine Corps. And, uh, and then separated. And again, you know, another long journey. But uh, yeah, that's how I ended up in the Marine Corps. What made me go? Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. So now we've, we've set the scene. We've, we've, <laughs> we, right? we've, we've built some context right. behind uh, the man who writes this book, We Fight Monsters. Um, so let, let's, let, let me start off uh, by reading from the book, uh, this quote here. Every man lives confusedly in darkness until he is willing to enter into light by exiting the womb of his life and leaving the safety of that environment. He has to make mistakes. He has to take chances. He has to be willing to be cut down by critics and applauded by praisers, even at times, ignoring what they say while he finds out for himself what is true and false. And even then, he'll never really know a thing until he leaves comfort behind. He must disregard everything told to him and all the safe passages he's traveled and those tubes and tunnels. It's only when he's free of back there will he understand what he left behind. Men will always be strangers to one another and themselves unless each learns by trial and error and ascertains the truth, that what he believed was only a theory, and until he applied it, he was but a theorist and not a realist. Truth has a way of cutting through nonsense. He must make his bones, and sometimes he must pay very big dues, but in the end, he will know the truth. What he knew before may have been right, but it wasn't until he questioned it and applied it will it sink in and make sense. The cause of any man's confusion is that he never found himself. But finding means searching, and a half-hearted attempt often comes from half-hearted men who in the end are just kidding themselves. So, Michael, We Fight Monsters is an absolutely fascinating collection of ruminations, maxims, quotes, essays about what it means to be a man and face death, fear, love, war, fighting. It's an uplifting battery of, uh, of prognostications, if you will, of how to be free, of how to dare, how to be reborn, as seen through the eyes of your own personal journey and self-discovery. At least this is what I have taken from it. But I will put it to you. What is We Fight Monsters? Because it's unlike any other book I've ever mm -hmm. read. What is We Fight Monsters about? And why did you write it? We Fight Monsters is about uh, basically any monster. And the worst monster is yourself. But any monster could be PTS. It could be alcoholism, pornography addiction. It could be um, drug addiction. It could be um, your own family. Um, the human, inhumane people that we see on the street uh, and, you know, I've seen enough violence and I think most of us have on TV and, and we wonder why, how is this possible? In the end, the monster was me and I was fighting myself, you know, mm. I was driven to destruction in order to arrive at an altered state. And that altered state was 
something greater, something better than the being that I felt that I was. And so, you know, uh, Hemingway said that, you know, we're all bitch from the start and you especially have to hurt like hell, you know, before you can write seriously. So I didn't actually write anything. I mean, I, I didn't really pick up anything until late in life. And so when I started writing a book, it was just uh, me getting on Instagram and giving it a go. I had no idea if I had the writing ability. I wrote and people liked it. I wrote more and people liked it. I had no clue. And I was even shocked when you asked me to come on your show because I saw some of the, the guests and I said, wow, these guys are fantastic. You know, Pat McNamara, you know, Pat mm -hmm. Saddle, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, but it's like Napoleon too. You know, I said, I feel myself driven to, to an end that I do not know. Uh, but as soon as I've, I've, as I've reached that end, that goal, nothing can stop me, not even an atom. And so I felt driven to create, I just didn't know how to create. Okay. But I also had two parts. I, I was living this bifurcated existence, which was this rage and this love this desire to create and build and, and love, but I was so ineffectual at doing that. I mean, I love so many women, but I didn't know how to love because I was out there destroying myself. But what's strange is in my desire to destroy myself, I was arriving at answers. The deeper and darker I went down some paths, the greater it was for me, uh, the payoff. And I was learning some type of truth. And so, you know, um, everybody does that. They want love. Everybody wants to give love and everybody wants to belong to something. I just didn't know how to do those things. And so in the end, uh, We Fight Monsters was a gathering of all of my, as you say, ruminations. And uh, it wasn't written as a way to negate what anyone else was saying. It was a way for me to exist. I was just writing to write. Uh, I wasn't arguing with anyone. You know, in the end, I realized that writing is something that you know, makes us a good reader, it, uh, something that's legacy uh, leaving. It's, uh, it's a way to entertain others. It's a way to um, help you argue better. You know, uh, writing is um, just something I had to do. I didn't understand why I was writing, but I was writing. There was no sense to the book. People just said, put it together. My wife said, put, this, put it together. People are obviously liking Instagram. I said, okay, give it a try. Yeah, well, um, what you put together is, uh, yeah, is absolutely fascinating. And you're, uh, you come across, I mean, in the book, you also comment on everything from film mm -hmm. to literature. Sure. And you, you, you're apparently very well read. Uh, so, uh, and I, I, is that go back to your time as a child? Because you said you read a lot of books. Yeah, so my dad was of that uh, uh, that uh, generation that grew up with some of the greats of the golden era. You know, yeah, Michael Moorcock. You know, any of the science fiction luminaries. You know, Ray Bradbury. You mm. know, Asimov. So we picked up a lot of um, uh, breeding material. My dad's writing a book now. He's eighty-two. He's got something that he sat on for forty years, and it's mind-boggling. It's so good. It's so ahead as a sci-fi book. I said, Dad, you know, you should have published this forty years ago. Uh, wow. You know? uh, my brother wrote a book for. Atari when it first came out called Space Knights. It didn't do well, but it was the first book that came out with David Heller. You can find an old copy on Amazon. Really? He was 17 years old. Yeah, he did the programming for the video games that went with the book. And then um, I threw my hat in the ring. I said, hey, let me give it a try, I suppose. But um, yeah, yeah, just grew up reading uh, books. And then I gave up reading just as I gave up running for, I think, seven or eight years. I just quit. Just one day I just quit. I gave it, I stopped reading. And then um, when my girlfriend separated from me, it was a very hard break. I, I was unemployed for a long time. And I just read, I think I read 400 books one year. Jeez. Uh, some, were, some were short, some were very long. You know, I read 16 to 18 hours a day. I had nothing to do. I didn't have a job. So I sat around and read. That's what I did. I had no clue. I just read everything from crappy, you know, books to really difficult subject matter that I really had a hard time penetrating. I'll tell you what, sometimes I fantasize about just being able to do nothing but read. And, you, right. you know, you just, <laughs> because I come from that generation as well, where, yeah. I mean, that was such a powerful medium. Absolutely. Um, okay. So back to We Fight Monsters. So quote you here. Mm -hmm. One of the secrets to being a man is never allowing the fiercest part 
of you to be tamed. Men are built to hurt, but we are not built to last. Keep fighting until the end. Men like swords can be forged in fire. Those who change with every burning become the most formidable of weapons. When men behave savagely, only men will understand. How easily men trap themselves in cages and then cannot free the animal they become. I am preoccupied every day in trying not to be an animal. And instead, I aspire to be a man. Michael, what is your vision mm -hmm. of what a man truly is? What is it that you aspire to? I think a man really needs a love. I think a man and every man I've ever met doesn't know how to do that right off the bat. And it was only through me hating and me hating myself and hating others that I was able to start learning to love. And that sounds so cliche, but that's the reality of it. Because what's the end result? I mean, if I'm out there fighting all the time and causing havoc, what's the end result? Death or a serious injury. There's got to be some payoff. And so for any hero, and I was a warrior, and I'll, let's, let, let me contextualize, I was a warrior looking for a war, but I couldn't get the military. So here I was, everything I was doing was trying to fight. I was trying to test my, my mettle and see, am I a man? Am I tough enough? Because I was a scared kid. And the more I did it, the braver I became because you know every little battle you have prepares you to fight a bigger battle. And so you are able to face up against someone, it doesn't bother you at all. So I was looking for a war. Uh, I didn't get the war I wanted, um, but you know, I think no matter where you are in your life, uh, where your station is in life, you have to seek out challenges. I don't care if you're a multi-billionaire or a poor person, you need to seek out challenges at whatever place you are in life. And so people change either by force or by choice. And it's either a great force, like you lose an arm or leg or cancer or something, and you wake up and say, I'm going to lose 100 pounds, or I'm going to do this, or I'm going to do that. Or you do it by choice, but you usually do it begrudgingly, a little by little, and your life changes you know, every day a little by little. So you know, 30 years from now, you're a little bit different. And some people change by great force, and that was me. I was looking for a truth in the world, and I didn't know where it was. You know. Um, it was kind of like uh, G.B. Shaw. Shaw, he said, you know, the truth is all men are in a false position in society uh, until they have realized their possibilities. And I didn't know what my possibilities were. I didn't have a clue what I was capable of. No idea. So being a man and, and that idea of it is I think that we're raised on this uh, idea that um, all people are good and there's love. And uh, but we never really acknowledge that anger or that ability to fight. And I think, um, for me, I see it as we all have it. It's on a spectrum from zero to 100, whatever the candle is up to the roaring flame. And so I see it as learning to contain that rage. And if you can contain it, and if you can use it in a way that's positive, you can really do a lot. And that's what it is. It's to find that balance. Mm. Um, those equities, I was trying to do that. Um, and in the end, it's about being a man is not trying to change yourself to virtue signal for everybody else out there. It's really being uh, an iconoclast to get out there and break rules and say, I don't agree. You know, uh, in the book I wrote, you know, I was in the bathroom and this guy said, I'm a Navy SEAL. You don't want to do that to me. And I just smashed him in the face and I stomp and stomped him into oblivion until his friend came into the bathroom and stomped me. <laughs> and my buddy came in and we stomped both of them and it was great. And I still have a great memory of that, but I just thought, who are you? You're telling me, I don't believe you and I don't care, but you're not going to tell me anything. It was my way. And I think a lot of people do that. We create, we do things as a way of what? Saying we exist. Whether it's making cookies or it's writing a book or riding a bicycle, it's saying I am something and um, I'm applying myself. So a fight or making love is a way to enjoy your being. And uh, that's all I was really trying to do, have autonomy over myself, have mastery of myself. And I had no clue how to do that. Mm. Yeah, okay, that, that is, um, you know, that is a deep but honest answer. It's a genuine answer. It's, it's something we can sink our teeth into uh, as opposed to all the shallow platitudes we hear these days about 
men, what, what is a man or, or, you know, what is a woman supposed to be these arc, these, these modern day archetypes. And I'll quote you here. You say, we destroy masculinity in America by doing more than just inculcating timidity in boys and promoting swaggering as a sin. We replace what's been tried and tested with what is worthless and unwanted when all a boy wants to do is prove himself as a man. We crush a boy's childlike faith in what is most probable about being a man and leave him doubting if masculinity is even a fact found within him. The new society makes it heresy to believe in ancient truths. So. Michael, why do you think today's society is attempting to destroy what it traditionally meant to be a man? Well, I think it's an argument that's been had for a long time, uh, which is uh, either, you know, the humanist versus the uh, uh, those who are the uh, theist. It's this idea, and they're not mutually exclusive, but I'm saying, you know, G.K. Chesterton, C.S. Lewis, you know, Frederick Copleston had a uh, great argument against uh, Bertrand Russell, you know, almost 100 years ago about the existence of God and this idea that if man is created in the idea of God, in the image of God, then he therefore must follow suit. And if he's not, if he's a humanist, like, uh, you know, he believed in science, etc., then there has to be this idea that he can be changed. And if you look at H.G. Wells, you know, he was a positivist, right? He was a person, or he's a positive person. He wrote so many great novels, you know, The Time Machine, um, you know, he wrote uh, so many novels, but when he finished up, he finished with what? Mind at the end of its tether, you know? Um, he wrote a very depressing book. You know, he was married to, I'm not married, he was dating Margaret Sanger, the, 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 the uh, individual mm -hmm. who created uh, Planned Parenthood. So this idea that we can somehow, what? Cut it out of man, right? Uh, it, it, we can re-engineer a man. We can cut out a part of him and make him better. And what does that even really mean? So. That's a very complex conversation, but I, I'll finish with, you know, T.S. Eliot, he said, we wasters of sorrows, you know, we wasters of our own lives. And it's this idea that we live and we exist, and then what we, we get in trouble is, is we're trying to repurpose our being. You're going to get hot water when you try to repurpose your being. When you try to give yourself a lobotomy and cut that brain out and, and, and you know, right here and uh, drive that ice pick right into that eyeball and cut that brain stem, but what do you do? And you're, you're, you're a zombie. And I think a lot of men are terrified of really living because, you know, Heming, Hemingway, he talked about that in Soldier's Story, uh, really that you have a higher, uh, a higher intensity of living. And then you come home and it's all taken away. So you have to live heroically. And, you, you know, a guy like him detests the trivial. And so my whole life was trying to find a higher way of living. And I think that's really what a man is. A man is a guy, whether he is a hero fighting dragons and Grendels, or he is bringing home a dinner to his kids, is a hero. And that's what a man needs to be every day, a hero. Every dang day, he needs to be a hero to his children, to his wife, to his friends, uh, and to himself. And, and so we take that away. We try to equalize everybody. We try to make it all relative. Mm -hmm. And that uh, I can't be better than you. And so we're weakening society. You know, Toynbee, Arthur Arnold Toynbee said, you know, the greater the challenge, the greater the man must be to rise up to that challenge. And that's always stayed with me. I quote a lot of these guys because I read a lot of them and I, I think about them all the time. And I, and I say, I think we're cheating ourselves. We're cheating ourselves of, of an experience to live authentically. You know, do I ride Harleys and eat ribs and, you know, chase girls and drink beers because I want it? Or am I doing it because I'm a caricature? I'm, I'm following every other guy that I think, well, that's what's tough. He's a biker. I'm going to be him. You know, scariest guy I know is my brother. I mean, he wears a, a suit, you know, mm. suit and tie. And there are a lot of the guys out there like that. You just don't mess with them. You just don't know. So I'm, I'm going to press on this question in another way. Sure. Um, this is going to be a, this is a bit long okay. because I've, I've kind of, I, I wanted to, there's two quotes in your in your book that I've kind of fused, but it gets to the essence of of a somewhat similar question. Mm -hmm. Okay, so do most of us live daily without a deep thought about where this nation is going? 
Do we even think about where it will be hundreds of years hence? And should we have any misgivings? We should, and we should have many. We've been made afraid to tell other people's children about the greatness of this country by political leaders and agitators that are part of the dumb and the damned. This country is one bright star in a universe of dull stars that seeks to dampen its brightness. Where would this world be without our nation of democratic processes, religious freedoms, and markets open to anyone, regardless of skin color or creeds? We are imperfect, but optimists and pessimists alike are allowed to live here in this world of tyrannical modernists and lunatics. <laughs> the, the, the worst of its cynics with the most corrupt of instincts would see this country reformed in the most extreme of ways. Indifferent people with indefinite beliefs seek to make what should be intolerable, tolerable. So that's one quote. I'm fusing it with this. We followed our heartfelt spirit of adventure to gather experience and in doing so created technologies to push us up from our mud heaps and carried us in our metal chariots into the sky. We learned to fly and breached black cold night. The bright stars were our destination. We were relentless. At the heart of every human can be discovered the spirit of wonder. Simply put, we were built to explore. Our old ability to harness the strength of our heart, body, and mind, like the Spartans of old, which once fused a strong society together, has been weakened from within by intellectual doubters that tell us we were never great. So my question is, mm. moderate, I'm sorry, modern Western culture books, films, advertising, education, it seems to be decidedly anti-human. I mean, you've named some, some authors there, uh, and you've actually touched on this very concept that humans, men aside, humans are bad. Men are worse. Men are worse. But humans are bad. We're bad for the climate. We're bad for the planet. There are too many of us. Man's destroying the earth. We're destroying the environment. We worship machines and artificial intelligence. As Agent Smith says in The Matrix, humanity is a virus. And apparently America is the worst offender of all, Michael. We are constantly told that America is evil, that the American dream is a lie. We're told that there's no such thing as American exceptionalism. So I put it to you. Why are the cultural elites and the intellectual doubters, as you call them, why is it that they seem to be bent on creating a self-hating, weak society? Not so they can control them. That's it. It's that simple. You know, um, <clears throat> you look at uh, Spengler, Oswald Spengler. I, I, I don't agree with everything. I mean, he was a, a racist, but he, he, he tracked, uh, I think, 26 civilizations, great civilizations. And, uh, you know, when you look at the Medes and the Persians, right? The, the Medes and mm -hmm. the Persians, uh, one, one culture got very lazy and the other one took them over. You look at the Romans and then you look at the outward pressure of the, the, uh, the Gauls and the Visigoths and everyone else that came and pressed from outside in. When you look at closed societies and when you look at what's great, well, what was great? Uh, in civilization, you had the Phoenicians, and the Phoenicians created what? You know, ships, shipwrights, shipbuilding. They're quite good, navigation, and you never heard of them. And there were other factors. I'm not saying there was only one reason why these cultures disappear. You look at the Athenians and the Spartans, and then you say, why, why do they disappear? They don't have a written language. Uh, they don't have art. They don't preserve anything. You look at the Chinese, and you have gunpowder, right? And you have other things. But the, 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 I think it was Emperor Han, I think he closed, it was a five kingdom and closed the kingdom. And so we never heard a peep from them. But when you looked at European culture and a lot of people say, okay, white privilege, what are you even talking about? When you're looking at the compass, when you're talking about trade, you're talking about um, all these things that Western civilization has even brought and what the Greeks that brought, uh, the Romans that brought to the future. And, and that's what we are thriving off of. And, and so we're getting weak again from within, from the bobble-headed buffoons that have no clue. And really all they really wanna do is they wanna control people. 
And so when you dumb down people, uh, they're easy to control. And so you play word games, the magical distortions, you know, wordplay. I mean, C.S. Lewis talked about that. Uh, Lewis wrote in um, The Everlasting Man. And if I recall, Lewis wrote, let me see, was it? No, I'm sorry. My, my apology. G.K. Chesterton wrote The Everlasting Man. And that in turn influenced Michael Collins to overthrow uh, the government in Ireland. And it also influenced Mahatma Gandhi to overflow, overthrow the British in England and in, in India, of course. Uh, and so, you know, here's a very deep thinker, Chesterton and a lot of his ilk that saw it very early on. They've been writing about it for what's over a hundred years now, predicted it. And now we're living it. It reminds me of what you wrote uh, when musing on, on Chesterton's book, uh, The mm -hmm. Man Who Was Thursday. Yeah, right. Right. You said yep. you said something about so I've got it here. You said the real anarchists whose philosophy brings the culture of death are something far worse than that. They mean death. Yes. When, when they say that mankind shall be free at last, they mean that mankind shall commit suicide. All right. When they talk of paradise without right or wrong, they mean the grave. They have but two objectives to destroy humanity and then themselves. Is this, you know, it, it almost seems like um, an existential struggle mm -hmm. uh, right now. If, if you're aware and you're paying attention, mm -hmm. um, you know, are you, are you hopeful uh, about the, of, about America's future? Absolutely. I am, you know, Kierkegaard, I already said, um, <clears throat> sorry, Kierkegaard, he said, you know, I must be, I must create my own system or be enslaved by someone else's system. You know, I think Nietzsche had the same vein of thought and, Am I hopeful? Absolutely. I mean, I believe that uh, there is good in this world, and I believe there are a lot of people standing by, and they're waiting to play a role. And I'm not talking about destruction. I'm not talking about, you know, having civil war. I'm not saying that at all. But I mm -hmm. think it's um, people are out there who are really in love with the good that is in this world and in love with the good that's in this nation. They see it. It's not some trope, some cliche. It's, it's something I've experienced as a person who came here from a foreign country to live here. Uh, my mother even knew that. She said, you know, God uh, gave me a lot. This country gave me a lot. Uh, my relatives, you know, they have master's degrees. They own homes. They have cars. They, you know, uh, they said, hey, do I want to go back to a village and live with a goat and a cow and, you know, 40 other relatives? You know, there's an old joke. <clears throat> it's, uh, I think it was from... Francis Fitzgerald's Fire in the Lake. She wrote it about Vietnam. <laughs> it's a funny one. It said, uh, basically, let's we can substitute Win, right? Mr. Win with uh, Boris or Vladimir or anyone else. But it's mm -hmm. basically the communist system, which is this. We would all rather sit in a circle and suffer than to have one person have one bicycle. <laughs> you would rather hate the person has a bicycle than everyone in the village. Have to, you know, and so let's not have bicycles. My dad told me a story about that. He said, that's a true story. You know, there was a guy who did buy a bicycle and everyone in the village borrowed it but him. He never got to ride that bicycle. And so, you know, we equalize everything. We make everything relative. Uh, and so where do you go? What do you do? But I am very, very hopeful. Absolutely. Spotter Up was created not because I wanted a tactical gear website. Spotter Up was a way for me to create out of my own, uh, you know, drive to express who I am. And in turn, I found out there was a lot of positivity. As dark and uh, some, some paths I'd gone down, I realized, my God, I, I do have hope and faith. I didn't realize I had that. Yeah, I, and we'll, we'll get to Spotter Up because certainly if you spend any time on Spotter Up, it is a very inspirational, motivating site. And there's a lot to be learned uh, about what you can do uh, if you have hope and you have knowledge and you, mm -hmm. and you have the right strategies so we'll, right. we'll, get, we'll get into that um but a good i'm glad um to hear that 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 you have hope it gives me hope when i hear something like that from someone who is as as well read and uh really has uh sound critical thinking skills um okay here's 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 another controversial uh subject sure um quoting you from the book <laughs> you're gonna give me hot water putting this out in the public eye right, but no, go for it not too many of them just a few but th this one is you know 
uh, you know, again, a, a, a profound issue uh, in our time right now. You say, keep preaching peace, mm -hmm. do nothing or do little when violence comes to others, but consider one day that violence may come to you. So be grateful if help comes from someone that won't auction their talents nor principles as you did. When it happens, it's not the time to figure what it is that you believe. Give regard to a moral code that has real principle, merit, and is useful because there are evil men out there. Give violence that is an appropriate response that fully adheres to your principles and if need be, destroys bad men in their tracks. So, I mean, this, this quote, mm -hmm. you know, kind of strikes me mm -hmm. as highly relevant in a time mm -hmm. and society where police are vilified whole cloth. Sure. Right. While, while, while most in law, uh, law enforcement risk their lives every day to keep chaos and criminals at bay, I'd love to hear um, your thoughts on this subject. Well, I do believe that there's a light in everybody. I believe it's um, that when people can understand that at, at its deepest part, when they fall in love with the idea of existence, and, and I'm going to contextualize it, okay. and someone dies, they're gone. They're gone forever. They're not coming back. It is the saddest, most painful thing when someone dies and they're gone. And you think about that. And so we, we extinguish one life, one person. It's terrible. So when a person can understand the value of their being, when they can get that, they won't cheat themselves in life, you know, and they'll fight back. Now, I'm not advocating violence. I'm simply saying that you know your worth. I remember um, walking up Hayden Ashbury one time and uh, this guy was going around slapping the tourist and, you know, punching people and people just in fear. And I said, what the hell is going on here? So I ran across the street and just started pounding the hell out of him. And people came up and shook my hand and said, thank you, thank you, thank you. And I thought it was bizarre. Like, why are you not sticking up for yourselves? Why aren't you standing up for yourselves? I just did not get that. Didn't understand it. But um, there are a lot of people who are going to sell themselves out, like, you know, like prostitutes and whores or whatever you want to call it. And I, I don't like to use that term, but I don't know how else to describe it, which is simply people really give a lot of lip service. You have to know what you believe and you have to know at that time, don't buy a gun and then pull it out and have no training because we've seen all the videos, these terrible videos where people get killed, injured, seriously, because they really didn't think about the consequences of their actions. You know, I said something like uh, men easily kill with their eyes, but do it with their hands and they lose their stomach for it. And uh, so we live in a society today that is being told a version of the facts, which simply are not facts, they're opinions. And opinion can be a fact, right? But um, we are inculcating kids with things that are untrue and it is affecting people uh, in, a, in a very bad way. But uh, I, I am hopeful and I think that Spot Up is a great receptacle. Uh, it's a receptacle of, of knowledge that hopefully people pull wisdom out of it and they can learn something, whether it's fitness, nutrition, shooting, running, you know, um, to help people to gain the knowledge and grab some skills so they can have some type of mastery and autonomy over themselves and, and some purpose too. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I just love this, this line where you talk about, you know, just you know, violence, you know, you know, you, you, you preaching peace when violence comes to others, but consider one day that it might come to you and be right. grateful if help comes from someone that won't auction their talents nor principles as you did. Yeah. And, um, yeah, it just, it, it, you know, it just, it strikes me that there are so many people out there that are giving their opinions on, on the subject of uh, police uh, and, uh, and, and violence uh, in the community. And, you know, they're, they're giving that opinion from a place of relative safety. Their lives are not threatened. They're 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 in a cocoon. They're mm -hmm. they're safe in their bubble, uh, and it it's it you know. I I just wonder if violence were visited upon individuals that you know are are preaching, 
that, um, you know, that police are, you know, all police are bad and that police, you know, police should be abolished. You know, I wonder if they would feel the same way if violence were visited upon them uh, and they were saved as many are every day by uh, having good police uh, on their side and helping them in times of trouble. And so, yeah, it's, it's just, you know, again, like I said, I could, uh, you know, I can make a podcast out of every one of your pet, the pages in this book, <laughs> we fight monsters. Thank you. Um, okay. Quote, when a great nation grants an insidious culture power to remove what it chooses to condemn, the death of a great civilization often begins. Any worthy movement to change the world for good is never based on ignorance nor enacted with malvolence. Be wary of evil shrewdly masquerading as a noble cause. Can you elaborate on that? Well, it's what we're seeing right now. Whether you like Trump or hate Trump or doesn't really matter. Um, you have to look at the bigger picture. Uh, you know, it's funny when people say they're a patriot. And I say, what does that even mean? A patriot is someone who loves his country. And people like to equivocate and say patriot means a jingoist. Uh, it's like, come on, man, stop playing semantical word games. It's, it's disgusting. Uh, the idea of a patriot is someone who, what, votes for what's best for his country. But most people don't do that. They vote for what's in their own self-interest. And so we see it all the time. And I wrote a quote about that, which was about the patriot and the mercenary and the fool. A mercenary will sell himself to whomever pays the highest. A patriot will give himself. So a mercenary will give his talents to anybody. A patriot will give his talents to his, his nation and a fool gives nothing. And I was talking about, um, oh, I can't remember the football player that kept kneeling all the time. So just this idea that he's a celebrated hero, it's like, what is a hero? He's supposed to be a patriot, not in the world I envision. No, I grew up on John Wayne and things like that, but that's uh, again, uh, white uh, pr uh, you know, privilege and I don't get that. Yeah, there were some terrible things that happened um, in our history of this nation, but it's done more good than bad. And that's why people still wanna come down here. And even you know, when you look at, um, uh, writer upon writer upon writer, you know, talking head will say, hey, people are coming here simply because um, they know it's a great country. And they have many rights that you don't have in other places. So, yeah, uh, yeah, it's it's happening here. But uh, whether you like Trump or not, and what's going on right now with this impeachment, um, I'd say people are playing a political game. It's not about what's best for this nation. It's about what's best for the power structure. And that's it. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, I think a, uh, I think another quote that kind of, mm -hmm. again, touches on this, this string here, a society with a culture obsessed on providing freedom and self-expression for all may find itself overtaken by society and culture that provides it to none. Sure. Can, can you elaborate on that thought as well? Because <laughs> it seems highly relevant to you know, our, our current environment. When did you wrote the book uh, a few years ago? When did you write the book? Uh, I mean, well, four, sorry. About, four, about four years ago. About You've four been years writing ago. these, these are a collection yeah. of, of your, of your writings yeah. over a period of time. Yeah. Up to, up till last year. So about three and a half years ago, yeah. A collection okay. of three and a half years of thought. So, so, uh, but again, this is an interesting quote because mm -hmm. it's, there's a dichotomy here a society with a culture obsessed on providing freedom and self-expression for all may find itself overtaken by a society and culture that provides it to none. So, you know, <laughs> elaborate on that. Well, I think it's kind of like, um, well, this has a lot to unpack. Uh, you know, we can look at Aldous Huxley, right? The Brave New World. We can look at 1984 with Eric Blair. We can look at these ideas of socialism. And even, uh, I think, um, uh, Jean-Paul Sartre, right? He knew too. I mean, he, he knew that the only other direction was communism, not a socialism. And he didn't even know the answer after he'd lived and written about this, um, this society, this great society. Uh, you look at H.G. Wells, you know, he too was a socialist. Um, so you give rights to everyone. 
and then who sets the rules you know you had um in um what things may come i believe it was the movie and the book and H.G. Wells, and they had this sky patrol that would roam the skies and, you know, find people who were doing bad and they would take them out. But who says, you know, you're going to decide what the new society, the new uh, uh, planetary alliance is going to decide what's right and wrong. And, and we, it's still, what is the moral truth? That's really what it comes down to. What is true? How do you define truth? You know? So if truth is relative, right? If truth is a moving target, then <laughs> you're never going to discern what's right or wrong. And we see it. And I don't want to get into too much into uh, knocking other societies or cultures. So mm -hmm. I'll talk about man himself. I'm not going to talk about mm -hmm. Islam or Christianity or Protestantism or uh, Hinduism or anything. In the end, really what it comes down to is I see that um, this is the greatest society of all, but we still have constructs. It said, uh, I think Jefferson said, um, we have the, uh, what is it? Um, right to pursue happiness, but we were not guaranteed happiness. Right. And that's what people misunderstand all the time. You know, I worked in Silicon Valley and um, I used to work for a furniture shop, my own, and um, we deliver and uh, furniture. And I'd see so many people from China and India and I'd speak to them and said, why are you here? He said, I'm an engineer. And said, what are you doing? I have a master's degree. And I'm like, my God, you know, this guy's making over six figures. He's got a gorgeous home. What are they going to do? Well, they're going to take that education and they're going to go back home and they're going to build their new Silicon Valley. And that's what, exactly what they did. I knew that because I went out of business um, 2000, but I saw the end coming. I saw the end coming because what was happening was China was taking our secrets and they were building our factories and plants. So anything that we could construct here, they were building overseas. And then they would take our American red oak and they would ship it over to China and they would build it manufacturing. This was before the age of the internet too, before the mm. bubble popped, um, after the bubble popped. But what had happened was uh, mom and pop shops like mine were gone. And then you had shops like Target and some of the bigger places, Walmart started selling furniture. They weren't selling furniture like we were at that time. And everyone else get on the racket and then the internet. But my point being is that I saw a giant shift and I saw when I came home from Europe, I said, I'm going to take the Greyhound bus and I'm going to drive across the United States. And I did. And city after city after city, the stores were gone. And this was a terrible, terrible time. I was in shock. Could not believe it. It was in 2000. Um, but the furniture stores that I loved, they were gone. Mm -hmm. And they were all overseas. So you're talking about giving society freedom. Absolutely. But what's happening is they're coming over here and they're taking our ingenuity, right? And they're bringing it back. And so it's great if you bring your own and it's great if you're a genius, it's fantastic, but we're giving you the opportunity. And so there should be some type of payback, but I think a lot of people look and, and we're get to whether, you know, capitalism and Marx and all that, I mean, I, I don't know how deeply you wanna get into this, but my point of view is that when we give everyone freedom with no consequences, we're in a bad place. If we give everyone freedom with no rules, and you see how that is now with virtue signaling, everyone is giving money to Black Lives Matter and Antifa, whatever they're doing. Mm -hmm. It's like, my God, what is your end, end goal? So, you know, some other thoughts on that. But um, that is something that we can no longer ignore. And I, we I have to stand up and do something. I think you've made a really good point. Um, you said something there mm -hmm. about free, you know, freedom without consequences. And you know, there there are those that paid the the price uh, for America, the for for this system that we have, this grand experiment that is the beacon, the shining light on a hill for the world. Um, for without. America, we would surely as a globe descend into darkness. We would descend into chaos. Uh, and in, in my opinion, and the opinion of many others, uh, complete totalitarianism. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I just interviewed um, Tom Glenn, who's the highest ranking spy in Vietnam at the time. I asked my dad about him, but uh, Tom mm -hmm. Glenn wrote four books, about 17 other papers. But uh, Tom Glenn uh, worked for NSA and uh, he spoke lots of languages, Chinese, uh, Vietnamese, uh, French, English, uh, German, but uh, you know, the book, The Last of the Enemies and the book um, basically enemies is um, Vietnamese was 
a derogatory slur, a, a slur by the Chinese against the Vietnamese, meaning troublemakers of the South. Okay. And so the idea of the book is the enemies, which is the the last of the people, uh, th this this these good people, you know. Um, and so the story is about a colonel and a woman who basically give up their child so the child can come to America with a U.S. colonel, a U.S. Marine Corps colonel. And she knew she was going to die. And he knew he was going to die because Saigon was falling in 75. And they said, America is the only place that's going to rescue us from, you know, the North Vietnamese. And that's a reality. I live that. So I don't give a crap what anyone tells me. I know the truth. I've lived the truth. Uh, as a little kid growing up, I saw and I can see this newsreels and I can read for myself. And if you do research, you can really find out mm. why do people love America? Because America gives so many people opportunity. N not all of us are, are born uh, with a silver spoon in our mouth, but it does give us the opportunity. And you can go out there. I know I've been broke myself. You know, I've had four businesses. I failed at miserably. And uh, now I'm in a stable place. And I'm like, my God, I can't believe my life. But I applied myself. I didn't look for handouts. I applied myself and I took risks. And I tell people all the time, it doesn't matter what your place in society is, your station in life, apply yourself. You know, when mm -hmm. I separated from the army um, in 2008, I think I put out 120 resumes in one month. I heard from two places. They, they were, the economy was terrible. I heard right. from the police department and then I heard from a moving company and that was it, making $10 an hour. And I was working three jobs and making $10, $10 an hour. Uh, until wow. I sorted myself out. And I was 41, I think it was, you know. So I was doing a young man's job, but you can make it if you apply yourself. See, and I think this is, this is the, the, the point that um, I'm kind of um, pulling from what you've said there about freedom without consequences, right? Mm -hmm. the, we, we could see that the cost has been paid for what we have. But now, okay, that price was blood. So now all those who get to eat from the trough, that get to have this opportunity, um, there's got, there has to be a price that, that must be paid. There, there must be, there should be some type of investment, right? Some, some type of, um, you know, and again, I don't know if consequences is the right word, mm -hmm. but there, there should, there, there should be, it, it shouldn't be free, right? You should, there has to be skin in the game. Sure, sure. But it it's to. not always gonna be paid by the good people. It's, I mean, it's, 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 not, it's not gonna be paid by the bad people or the leeches or the people who just live off of everyone else. It's gonna be paid by heroes. It always will be. I mean, what does a hero do? And I'm not saying I'm a hero, but I'm saying a hero is looking for a fight. A hero, he goes out to the cliff. I wrote about that. He goes out to the cliff and he looks out you know, and he, he sees the challenge ahead and he says, I'm going towards the dinner war. That's it. That's what he does. And that's what he'll always do. He'll commit himself. And there's always going to be those men that are going to rise up, men better than me, boys better than me, you know, guys better than me. And they will go and bring the fight and they will change society for the better. I do believe that. Uh, they look for the challenge and they're okay giving themselves up. You know, the candle burns twice as bright, burns half as long. That's the way we live. That's the way we should live. And so everyone else will live like, you know, uh, it was actually... Um, H.G. Wells, it was the, the time machine. So remember the Morlocks and the Eloy? Mm -hmm. So the Morlocks and the Eloy, you know, they would lower someone down, they would be eaten, and they would uh, have these uh, subhumans. Even uh, Aldous Huxley, you know, covered that, right? Uh, you had the Alphas and the Deltas and all that. And it's just society, you're always going to have those who, the elites, um, who are going to benefit from the hard work of, of, of the, the, you know, everyone else the labors of everyone else. And in that, there are going to be heroes. Now, those dystopian novels were written, there was no way out. They were very depressing. I don't believe that at all. I mean, my, my journeys and my travels and what I've seen, uh, again, is Elliot. We wasters of sorrows, we wasters of our own lives. I think we need to get out there and live and live as best we can and get dirty fingernails and dirty hands and get our hands into the thick of life and fix things. And Spotter Up Again was my creation, was my way of saying, screw you world, uh, screw you universe, I'm fighting back. And if I can leave a receptacle of knowledge, even if it's not Tolstoy's, you know, War and Peace, at least I'm going to leave something. Hopefully someone will love it and someone's life will be changed and improved because of it. Yeah, fantastic. Um, okay, quote. Mm -hmm. Every man who stores away his secret griefs is better huh. served seeing what good he might grow out of those seeds of pain. Yes. 
Perhaps there are parallel roots with other men that grow because of the injuries of war he experienced or from some death or divorce. Patrolman, pastor, Marine, or just simply a man. True friendships do blossom and can save man from loneliness, anger, grief, and self-loathing. But he'll never know that until he decides to stop carrying those rotten kernels of destruction in his bag of darkness. So if we're talking, Michael, about PTSD mm. uh, from bullying or abuse, or if you're, mm. or if you're a first responder or a combat mm. veteran, uh, then perhaps from moral injury or survivor's guilt, your mom had survivor's guilt, mm. as you mentioned, the trauma of, you know, consistent and repeated violence um, and how it affects those who cannot find peace from the, from those memories. Mm. How, how does that individual, how do you, how does one figure out what good might come from those seeds of pain? Well, if they're fortunate, then they'll have a spouse like me who will beat on their head every day and say, go do it. And thank God for my wife, because she was on my butt for seven years. You know, I put in uh, three years of college and then finished, you know, <laughs> four years thereafter. Same as um, uh, how she got me into therapy. I didn't want to go. I'm like, heck no, this woman's crazy. You know, so I went. <laughs> so I finally went and that's how I ended up where I'm at. So if you're fortunate, you'll have friends, family, someone, uh, an outsider that helps you. And on top of that, and hopefully, and I guess we can talk about those who um, were in the military law enforcement. I mean, we're trained for, you know, being good at pattern recognition. You know, we're good at studying people, but we're not good at studying ourselves and knowing ourselves. And I think people probably need to lean on that. Uh, lean on that background of theirs and 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 yeah. have the courage, uh, you know. So I tell people, join a group, you know, have a brotherhood, have friends, church, something that helps you get out of that malaise, out of the depression or the aggression or whatever it may be. But um, you're going to have to because there's two ways. You're going to either go willingly, or you're going to go forcibly, or you're going to go, you know, when you break down and and you have no choice, they're going to carry you. And you're not going to have any say because you're incapacitated. You're passed out, man. I mean, you you are just not mentally there, mm. and you'll get fixed. And I got patched up and fixed, and um, that's what happened. That's good. That's good. Um, you got to be fortunate and find someone. You got you, you got you got to have a tribe. Sure. Um, men. So okay, this is a great quote. Mm. <laughs> men leave home to become gods. Ah. And the world will always destroy them and send them back as martyrs. Are, are, are we forever doomed like Icarus to fly too close to the sun and, and, and kind of have our wings burned? Why, why do men aspire to be gods? I think it's, it's in us. I mean, we have what we, and we're born with potentiality, right? We're right. born with curiosity. Well, we have the ability to build and smash with these hands so why not use them in every way you, you can and so that's what i did you know absolutely um but you're never going to know i mean and and so you have to go to a very very dark place sometimes too either willingly uh, i went very willingly and then uh, it spit me out so you go deeper and deeper and deep, deeper into the whale's belly and then mm. you are spit out into the darkness you know so um Sometimes it's like Jonah, right? Nineveh, right? So you don't want to go to Nineveh. He's like, heck no. So God said, hey, man, uh, he gets swallowed by a whale, you know? And so you, you really have to go out there and live and live your best. I mean, that's the whole idea of Spotter Up, the, you know, the arte, right? The uh, padilla, the arte is excellence, living the highest virtue. Uh, we have so much potential every one of us i don't think i'm unique and anyone else is not unique i think all of us have the spark of life it's just that when you uh take on challenges you get better and better and better at understanding patterns you get better at uh, arriving at a conclusion you get better at uh, networking and making friends and uh understanding what's the next step and that's what i did i had to go through some terrible doors mm -hmm. to get to spot up um, all right. Uh, so I'm going to ask you, uh -huh. um, another question that is, it kind of about this, 
this theme of, uh, and you've, you've, you've mentioned it earlier, you mentioned this, this um, concept of self-reliance. Mm-hmm. And I want to, so this is a, a bit of a quote here from the book. It's a slightly long one, but you say, we should never pay a professional to fight for us for we end up selling a part of our soul away for a false sense of safety. Modern education omits a real understanding of who we are in its movement to equalize everything. Education is disintegrated because of relativism. Learn to fight in some way, whether it's verbal judo or straight up in the street jujitsu. Learn to think for yourself and to box for yourself so your thoughts are strong and your punches make connections. Whether it's homeschooling or home defense, you should be involved in the deepest aspect of it rather than leaving it to others, like the government and its educators, to defend what you need, what you want, and what you believe. Don't presume that others will battle for you or battle as well as you would battle. The ability to fight starts in the home, and your children should think likewise. In the absence of an integrated curriculum in life, which starts at home, youth begins to see the world in fragmented forms and misunderstands the unifying nature of the universe. The modern world stands against a collective truth, and without truth, how can one understand anything? Men must be able to think critically and not simply repeat what they've heard parroted a million times before just because it's been stated by those in positions of power. A man who cannot rule over himself has no business ruling over others. And if he refuses to be educated as well, then he has no business educating others, nor will he ever be respected as the head of his home. This generation spends too much time mixing deep feelings with light thinking, and we end up with boys that are spiritually dead. So given that, and I I agree, How do we take ownership over our education and create a a curriculum of self-reliance and knowledge that will truly serve us in this world? Because nothing that is taught in school can prepare you for life. Nothing I learned in school prepared me at all for life. It's what I learned, you know, outside of school, on my own, or just living through school that help, but it's no better today. So how, how does one create such a curriculum? Well, you have to go back to what the Greeks were doing, right? So the whole idea of paideia, and it shifted mm. a lot. So what's happened now, you're of my generation, and there's another generation where you studied Latin, you studied Greek, we don't do that anymore. And so the Greeks did what? The Greeks had this unifying theory of truth, and uh, this unifying theory that all um, ideas and thoughts and things came from one epicenter, one source, and now it's all fragmented. It's, well, let's teach this today, and let's teach that today, and let's teach this, and it becomes so relative that your head wants to explode. There is no truth. So we have to go back to that. And what did that strong society do, which was uh, you had the gymnasium, right? You had um, rhetoric, you had um, uh, music, playing the flute, you had uh, playing the lyre. So you did these things. You had um, argumentation, you know, uh, plays, you wrote plays, uh, you attended uh, high art, you know, you went to the arena and then you saw fights or whatever it may be. So whatever society, and that's, that's been watered down. So we no longer do that. And so we have to get back to this idea of uh, arete, excellence, the highest of high, right? The excellence of the bull or the excellence of the door, or the excellence of the uh, ship. And so we have to infuse kids with this belief that you can learn a lot a lot more than you think you can learn. And then uh, you have to apply it and, and tell them, go out and take risks. Let me tell you something. I used to fight, I went to a gym and I used to uh, do martial arts uh, mm-hmm. every day. And okay. the, the instructor knew, I just wanted to learn how to hurt people. I just wanted to fight. I had no clue whether it was good or not. So I was 19 going to uh, the studio and um, he tries, he shows me a couple moves and I go out that night and I get in a fight. And I'll tell you, I did a flying kick this guy grabbed my leg and he beat me up pretty bad. I had to grab his head and uh, bang it on a uh, car fender and got out of there. I went back and told my instructor, I said, that did not work. He said, well, of course. And I said, well, you know, I didn't understand. I, I knew the concept, but until I applied it, 
and I say that's a theorist and a realist until I actually applied it that I learned. I didn't know. I mean, I didn't know that I knew nothing. And I just didn't work for that environment. And I got better and better. And I'm not saying I'm a great fighter. I'm simply saying I had a lot of curiosity. Um, I wanted to find out if I was good at anything. And, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share, well, we'll leave, we'll leave that for another time. But um, I had to apply myself and I had to ask questions and we have to get kids back into that, whether it's homeschooling, which I think is fantastic. Um, but we have to get schools to start teaching that unifying theory of, of truth, that there is something out there. And it's not, not just changed based off of the culture. You know, do we teach shamanism? We teach um, some type of ancient, you know, philosophy that really seems like it's going to hold up but it doesn't and that's the problem you know we confuse philosophy with preaching with agitation you know uh with with action when it really isn't anything at all it's just words so um another quote a lot of men suffer from what i term mental and emotional snow blindness mm. chasing so much after what is good mm -hmm. brings about what is bad and they can no longer see opportunity. And you, you, you mentioned the late actor Richard Burton stated mm -hmm. that he drank for solace to burn up the flatness, the yes. stale, the, the, the dull deadness that one feels when one goes off stage. And I think that's what you were somewhat referring to. So what, it, what does this mean that um, a lot of men are suffering from uh, emotional snow blindness? Well, emotional snow blindness is the fact that uh, people want to live a higher high and can't. They have an existence like, like me, where you see something and you are driven to go to the top of the mountain. I mean, you're talking about Richard Burton. Let's talk about the actor and let's talk about Sir Francis Richard Burton, right? Sir Francis Richard uh, Burton, <laughs> Sir Francis Richard Drake Burton, I think that was, and Jonathan Speak, who were looking for the source of the Nile. Incredible people, man. There's a great movie called Mountains of the Moon, and there's an incredible book on uh, Richard Burton, The Explorer. But um, for me, uh, it is really driven to find something. And I'm going to tell you, I, I went into the Foreign Legion. I didn't think you were going to ask me that. But really? That's something I, yes. So that's something I did. And I would sit on the docks of Oakland every day. And I would think, what is my life? Where's my war? Where's my battle? So you have to test yourself. And you have to say, is what you believe really true. I really got deep into my psyche and said, how screwed up am I? How good am I? I had no clue because I had no comparison and contrast point. No idea. And so when I tell people, you know, you think you're a mercenary, you're selling yourself, you're selling your skills, you're selling whatever, you don't really know um, until you do it. You go through the door. You don't know if you're a good lover, a good fighter, a good writer, a good father, a good son until you apply. And then you, you, you make adjustments. Um, you, have, you make adjustments, but you have to get out there. And so snow blindness is really, that mental uh, snow blindness is really people who are in the military or law enforcement and they experience some very profound moments and they get home and life is flat. And now they're working at McDonald's and I've been there mm -hmm. and they're working at a place that they hate and they don't like their boss. And they say, why am I taking orders? You know, my dad was in Nam, right? Uh, spent 10 years fixing the country, he comes home and he's, Got a 30 year old kid in charge of him telling him what to do. My dad says, why am I listening to you? I was listening, I was working with the greats when I was a kid. The greats, you know, in their fifties were showing me how to plug this together and do this and build this. And I was building computers and doing things that you have no clue of. And that's what it is sometimes. So we are looking for something greater. The problem is, is that anytime that we question something seriously, and anytime we try to give a serious answer to uh, we're, we're, we're met with laughter and arrogance and foolishness and silliness and people think that they are somehow better than us. And all we're simply trying to ask is how do we improve the world? You know, how do we make things better? And uh, there are men out there who are suffering because they simply want to make the world better. They want to bring good into this world and they have the skills to do it. They just need that circumstance. I did not have the opportunity door after door after door after door closed on me, but at least I tried. And that's what men need to do is they need to try not give up. Don't give up. Don't ever give up. So, so maybe that's where, um, mm -hmm. 
you know, the, the anger that a lot of them feel, maybe it stems from there. So, you know, quoting you from the book, you say that, I'll tell you that managing your anger is a key step toward making every single relationship in your life right. Yes. Until you learn how to manage your anger and break your aggression cycle, all you will ever be is a puppet to that emotion. I choose not to be a slave. And I want to thank Dr. Stephen Bann, retired FBI special agent, my friend and counselor. I would not be here today if I didn't go to see him for depression and anger. Why, Michael, are men angry? And, and tell us about your battle with, with anger and depression. Where, where did it come from and, and how did you manage to, you know, to cage that tiger? Well, anyway, it's uh, kind of like um, <clears throat> men are basically like little boys. That's all we really are. A lot of us, uh, we're, we're smashing a toy or smashing someone's head. Uh, that's what we are. And so until we change mm -hmm. how we think, we're just a 30 or 40 or 50 year old little boy. And a lot of people don't learn those skills. They don't take that crayon and do something good with that crayon. And so uh, they're trapped and they feel trapped every day and they don't know how to apply themselves and they're looking for circumstance. The thing is that people have to get out there and apply and chase opportunity instead of waiting for some type of circumstance, something to fall out of the heavens onto their plate and give it to them. A lot of men do have anger. It's natural. We're supposed to have anger. We're supposed to have, you know, uh, sadness and the, the ability to express all that plethora of emotions, that, that strata of emotions. The problem is that a lot of people focus too much on the anger. They don't work, work on the other aspects that they should. And so it comes to the fore. That's all they use. You know, uh, you use a hammer to fix everything that needs a paintbrush. They never learn the life <laughs> skills to do that. And that's all I, I did when I was younger. I used a hammer. I had no clue what a paintbrush was. It wasn't until I went to Dr. Band's office and said, oh, I'll build Spotter up that I began to write and said, hey, I might be okay at writing. I have no clue, no clue. But men do have anger uh, and they will have anger until the day they die. How much anger? A flame or an inferno? It's just managing that and understanding it never leaves you. We're not a light switch. You don't just turn it on and off. It's always there and it's okay. It's like that eternal flame. It's okay to have that. And keep it for the bad guys. Don't keep it for the wife. Don't keep it for the kids. Don't keep it for anybody but the bad guys. That's all. That's great. That's great. Um, okay, perfect time to ask you uh, about Spotter Up. Sure. Be because okay, so Spotter Up. Let, let's talk. Let, let's talk about what is Spotter Up. <laughs> <All right. laughs> because I I I go into Spotter Up and there's so much going sure. on there. What what is Spotter Up? Why did you create it? Talk. Let's talk about Spotter Up. So uh, I guess it's kind of complex, um, <clears throat> but yes. I'll try to be as quick as possible here. Uh, Spotter Up. I was raised on the idea of Western uh, civilization and the Greats, the Greeks, uh, when I was in tenth grade, and it always stayed with me. And so um, when I began to have marriage issues and a lot of other issues going on, I went to Doctor Ban's office with my wife, and uh, Doc Ban. He's a great guy, behavioral scientist. He actually created the uh, behavioral science. Uh, department for the FBI. And, you know, they were guys that got together and they would capture really? serial killers. You can read his book. It's a great thing. And I, and I asked him one time, I said, is it like, like CSI, the TV show? He says, nothing like that at all. He said, no, they would actually come into our office with all these uh, diagrams and pictures. And we would sit with a panel behind a table and we say, well, he's probably blonde, probably 27, probably lives at home with his mom. And he's probably doing this. And they did. They caught a guy who's uh, blending up body parts in a blender. It's a fantastic story. The Mind Killers, I think is the name of the book. Fantastic. Great guy. Really? And um, I sat down and I said, you know, I've tried so much in my life and I failed and failed and failed. What do I do? And I told him my, some of my dreams. He said, um, tell me one. I said, well, this idea of spotter up is just a receptacle of knowledge. I just want to leave something for someone like maybe about hiking or camping or shooting. You know, I have some skills. And he said, okay, build it. And I said, yeah. He said, yeah. I said, okay. And it just took one man to tell me that. But the thing is that because he had all these degrees and he was very accomplished that I listened. Maybe if he was just a Joe Gasoline station attendant, maybe I wouldn't have listened. But, you know, that was where my mind was, was here's an older man, a mentor. Uh, now he's a mentor to me, you know, a good friend, a good family friend. But he said, build it. So I went home, uh, came back next Saturday for a therapy session. He said, uh, what are you doing this week? I said, I built a website. He said, what? So I showed him. He said, oh, my God. So he couldn't believe how massive it was because that's me. You know, I built this thing. And. <laughs> So uh, Spotter Up um, basically is about spotting a solution to a problem. It is um, based off of the Greek hole man, and it's the idea of the gunfighter, the writer, the wild man, monk. 
Uh, I created those words as a mnemonic device for me to remember when I'm explaining it to people at trade shows. It's basically the man of intellect, the man of emotion, the man of spirit, and the man of action. It is a man who's well-read. He's not one-dimensional. He can shoot, he can read great books, and he can write, and he is a spiritual person, and he loves his wife, and he loves his kids, and he goes to church or wherever he goes to. And that was the idea of Sparta. It was trying to get people to take pop culture and fuse it with the ancient Greeks and say, here's something that's probably palatable to, to people. And it has everything. So it's got uh, shooting, nutrition, fitness, PTSD, articles on whiskey, uh, you name it, we have it. And we have over a thousand gear, re gear reviews. But at the end of the day, Spot Up is really about uh, wisdom. It was, was my goal to help people get back up to the top of the mountain and tell them, your life's not over, you know, keep performing, don't give up. I've been there. You know, we're all bitch from the start and you have to hurt like hell. But once you hurt like hell, you're going to have something there. I tell people the pain, that's a blessing. That is not a curse. And I've learned that. That pain you feel, that, that, that pain, that's good. Now do something with it. And that's really what Spot Up is about. So I, I'm, I'm on Spot Up and I'm reading and I'm reading and I come across a term which I have not heard of before. Right. <laughs> um, chessmen. Uh, right. The chessman philosophy. Right. <laughs> what is because, you know, Spotter up preaches, um, you know, becoming like a master chessman. Sure. What is a chessman and what is the chessman, chessman is philosophy? someone who's just a strategist of, of life. Uh, you know, there's five aspects of health that mental health professionals normally agree on. And there's some people say eight or ten, but I, I, I okay. filtered it down to five, which was, you know, you work on your emotional health, your spiritual health, your uh your social health, your social circle, friends, that kind of thing, your physical health, right? And so what happens is people may have four out of five, they may have, uh, or even two out of five, they have their physical health and their mental health, but they don't have spiritual health, right? Right. They don't have emotional health. And that's the problem. So Spot Up was a way to have many, many articles for people to read and on building up your emotion. You know, uh, we call it um, weaponizing behavioral sciences, or we have... Um, articles on fitness we have articles on nutrition so it's a way for people to build those pillars and so really what it is it's a rook and i use a lot of medieval iconography uh, in the artwork if you look at it you know you have a skull which is not death it actually symbolizes life in medieval iconography you have a castle which is a fortress of power uh, of safety you have uh, uh, the spotter on the tower and that person looks 360 all vantage points and he sees everywhere he needs to go he can see time way down there and he can spin around and see where he needs to go next. And so the idea of the chess piece or the chess man is a man who lives in such a way as a strategist that he begins to see uh, what his aim is, what his ideas, what his plans are in life. And so basically he has, uh, he's doing more than uh, just living. He's affecting the life. Uh, he's um, involved in it in his innermost depths. And so that's really what the chess man is. It's just a person who is, trying his best to be the best he can be every day for his kids. And I don't care if it's a janitor. I don't care if the guy's a McDonald's because I've been there. I've done both and is to really do the best you can. And if all, all you can do is just a little bit, that's better than yesterday. And that's uh, really in a nutshell. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, and mention, speaking about the artwork, I will tell you right now that you've got the absolute sickest collection of t-shirts yeah, um, on there. The artwork is absolutely mind-blowing. Uh, and in fact, there's the, a picture behind you uh, yeah. is one of the, yeah, is one of the t-shirts, the artwork on that, on that uh, picture there. Um, so yeah, there's like just uh, not just the, the, the t-shirts, but you know, there, there's uh, suggestions on books, what books to read. Right there, there's like you said, reviews on whiskey. There, there's so much in there uh, that you know I find myself fascinated. I'm, I'm, I'm on the site navigating, you know, at first researching, and then I'm like, wow, this is an incredible resource. I'm so happy I found this. Um, so okay, we we've come to that time. Mm -hmm. uh, you've been very generous with your time, by the way, Michael. Uh, I want to say thank, thank you. you. Um, where can our followers uh, and our our audience and those who watch the podcast, where, where can they, they find you and your ideas uh, and, and learn more? Okay, so um, we have YouTube. Uh, we do a lot of great interviews with a lot of neat people. Uh, YouTube, just type in Spotter Up. 
Um, you can find me on Instagram. I write every post on there. I try to come up with original content every day, if possible. But you can read uh, my memes and some of my thoughts uh, on Instagram. We're also on Facebook. There's a team room. You can just join. Um, and then um, if you want to buy the book, We Fight Monsters, you can find it on Amazon. But if you go to Spot Up Shopify and Google or DuckDuckGo or something like that, type in Spot Up Shopify, you'll find uh, our website for apparel and our book. And I'll sign that. And I've signed hundreds and hundreds. So um, I'd be happy to send it out to your, uh, your listeners and, and viewers. So thank you. That's amazing. No, thank you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to close out with this, this, uh, this closing thought. Uh, from your book. Okay. So, quote, my Instagram posts started merely as an, ex as an exercise for myself. I hope you found it enjoyable. I wanted to work out some kinks in my thinking. Whether brilliant or not, I ask you to work to find peace in your heart. Surround yourself with friends, lovers, family, and be grateful for the little you have. You have power over your mind. Find your strength and share it with others. You will not want to flee, but rather choose to say, realize this, nothing can harm you. Home is where the heart is. So uh, with that, um, I, I bid you uh, farewell, Michael. Um, it has been an absolutely fascinating discussion. I left half the questions I had on the table. <laughs> right. could have, I could have done, you know, I could have done this for like another two hours. You're, yeah. you're absolutely fascinating guest and there's you, you're just a wealth of of knowledge um and you know you can pick up we fight monsters and you can get lost in it it's not the kind of book that you're going to read and then that's it it's on the book it's on the bookshelf never to be read again it's the kind of thing that i find myself going back to again and again just just reading a few of those quotes every day it really does have an impact so i want to say thank you for coming on the show. Thank you for writing that book. Um, you have definitely left something. You've left your mark. Uh, you've left You've left a resource for the ages. Greatly appreciate it. Thank you for coming on the Alpha Human Podcast. Thanks, Lawrence. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Awesome. All right. Have, have a great evening. You too.